Good morning. How's everyone this morning? Well, Jordy's really good, apparently. Let's ask the Lord to be with us this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for the sunshine. And God, we just thank you for the blessing you've bestowed on us. We ask that as we worship you and as we look at your word, that you would be with us and you'd make yourself very real to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand if you're able. Let's worship the Lord with all of our mind, our heart, and our soul. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest dream. Yes, 
each other please Please join us in singing Cornerstone. Oh, 10,000 reasons. Sorry. I'm a little behind. Before, oh my soul, I worship 
have a few announcements that I need to make. Um, if you are on the nominating committee, you know who you are. 
I need to see you uh, immediately after service uh, so we can get some things lined up so we can start getting meetings lined up going into kind of need to have this stuff done before the annual meeting the first of the year so if we can meet uh, during coffee time immediately after service that would be greatly appreciated um, this Friday November 16th we have a meeting for the planning committee for the 150th anniversary that's at 7 p.m. Next Sunday evening, we have the community Thanksgiving service that is at Rosini Lutheran just down the road here. Um, we'll be participating in that. That's at 6 p.m. The Akron one is Wednesday, November 21st at 7 p.m. at Emmanuel Lutheran in Akron. Um, Operation Christmas Shoebox, this makes my heart happy to see that we have a bunch of people that are wanting to make children who are a little less fortunate or a lot less fortunate than we are enjoy Christmas a little bit to see this but we need to have all of these if you're gonna do one we need to have them in by today because Thursday they're going to Sioux Falls and uh, so they can be distributed appropriately um, we will be doing our Christmas decoration extravaganza I just made that up by the way of Big Springs on Sunday November 25th during the Sunday school hour. So we will not have normal Sunday school. We will be helping participate because we have a very large room and it takes much work to get this decorated for Christmas. So stick around if you're able so we can, we can help Carolyn with uh, making this place Christmassy. And you, I need you guys' help because I'm not Christmassy at all. So, <laughs> so we'll need your help with that. And uh, also we have the, the ladies are going to the Browns Christmas concert on December 1st. We still have tickets for that, Mary Beth? We have only 12 tickets left. So if you want to go to that, ladies, uh, see Mary Beth today and she will get you taken care of. Um, those are, what's the price on those again? $17 for those. And one more announcement. Um, Dan Solberg called me uh, Friday, I believe it was, and uh, said he has a doctor's appointment in uh, Sioux Falls on Tuesday and he needs a ride if someone is willing and able to help with that that would be greatly appreciated um, see me after service and we'll get you hooked up so uh, so we can get him there it's an early one <clears throat> he's got to be in Sioux Falls by 8 o'clock in the morning and sometimes I don't even know if God's up that early so um, so if you can help with that come see me afterward after service today and we'll get you hooked up with Dan and and uh, get him where he needs to go he's doing well he's home uh, he's having some fun getting his antibiotics right now. It's not a lot of fun, so, um, but he's, he's in pretty good spirits. And So if you want to go see Dan, go see him at his home. That's where he's at now. He's no longer in the hospital. All right, let's uh, ask the Lord to bless our tithes and offerings today. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for every blessing that you've bestowed on us. As the song says, God, that... That everything that we have, everything that we are, even this breath that we breathe is nothing but a gift of God. And God, we want to take time to give a portion of that back to you. And we ask that you bless it and you multiply it to meet the needs of this community. In Jesus' name, amen.
Amen. <clears throat> well, we have a special guest or special guests here. You guys haven't seen the the row of people in the in the front here. This is uh, my parents and my brother Jeremy and his family. Um, if you want to know kind of why I'm the way I am or curious why I'm so weird, um, you can blame Dad's pointing at my mom. Uh, but you can blame this. <laughs> or you can be thankful for that, whichever way you, you view it. But uh, um, a large portion of the way I view life, the way I minister, um, is directly attributable to my parents. Um, the way I approach um, relationships within the body of Christ is a direct result of how we've treated family for my entire life. Um, you, you would find if you were to come to my mom's house on Christmas that um, mom and dad instilled us in a young age that everybody's a high note, so anyone's welcome. Come on, come as many as you want. Come into the house. You're all welcome. And, uh, and we've had many struggles and many trials, but we come together as a family because that's what we do, and that is part of why I deal with the church the way I do because we are the family of God and so we struggle we stripe we do all those things but in the end we come together and we come together in unity and love and grace and you, so you can attribute a lot of that to my family so I encourage you after service today to come up and introduce yourself and uh, chances are if I know my brother he'll be out the door and heading down the road more than likely but uh, but he's got a basketball thing in, in Ottawa um, later this afternoon. So, but if you can, stop by, see them, um, introduce yourself, and uh, tell them how awful I am. All right, we're going into a, uh, going into a whole new series now. Um, we spent the last few weeks in Ephesians 4 talking about what it means to walk in a manner worthy of the calling. And we looked at what gentleness was and what patience was, what humility actually looks like. And, uh, and the, the idea is that uh, the life of a Christian is really the life of everybody else's needs are more important than my own. I should lay every need and want of mine down for the sake of other people and trust that when I do that, God will make sure that all my needs are met. And that's where we've spent the last several weeks. But we're going into some very, very good times of Thanksgiving and Christmas and these holiday times, and I want to talk a little bit about that. I, uh, I didn't used to think that the holidays were good times, because I worked in retail. And I think you guys heard one of my stories the last time we were here, and how I used to get just berated by these little old ladies at a grocery store, because how dare you not have more whipping cream in the dairy aisle when I have a pie to make, and, and I got, you get berated, and I would sit there and everyone tell me it's the happiest time of the year, but it's the time I saw the grumpiest people on the planet, and usually they were God's people. They were the grumpy ones because we've got these traditions that we want to uphold, and if I can't do that, then I'm going to be mad, and I'm going to be angry, and I'm going to lash out, but I want us to look and maybe take a different look at the holidays and take a different look at what it means and why we celebrate these things and so there are things that we need we can look at in the scriptures that barring all other outside events we can look at exactly who God is and what he's done for us and to us and with us and we can be grateful and we can celebrate and then he he's a really good guy like that and he actually gives us ways in which to actually show gratitude and gratefulness. And I want to look at one of those today. So over the next couple of weeks, we'll be looking at several of these things we should be grateful for. And then how does God tell us that we should express our gratitude in those things? So um, let's, we're going to dive right in here, but I want to give you some context here. We're going to be looking at Deuteronomy chapter 26. Oh, he's preaching out of the Old Testament. That's never good. I'm going to preach out of Deuteronomy chapter 26, but I want to give you some context of the way if you want to know how to read the Old Testament where it makes some sense, because let's be honest, sometimes the Old Testament doesn't make a lot of sense. But if you want to make it, want it to make sense, here's what we have to understand. The book of Exodus is the story of God delivering the children of Israel out of Egypt, out of bondage. They were slaves in Egypt, and God 
delivered them from that through Moses, very familiar through the plagues and all those things. And then they, they stop in Mount Sinai. And so chapters 1 through 20 of Exodus is this story of Israel coming out of Egypt and getting to Mount Sinai. The rest of that book is about Israel in Mount Sinai receiving the law that God was going to have them operate in the rest of the time. So when you get to the end of Exodus, they haven't left Sinai yet. They're still in this mountain, and God's given them this long law. The book of Leviticus is not a new law or the same law. It is actually specific instructions given to the priests, the Levites of the time. And so there's specific instructions to the priests on how to operate and work inside the law that he'd already given them in the last parts of Exodus. Then we get to Numbers, and in Numbers, that's where God says, okay, now that I've given you the law, I've told you how you're going to operate, now you're going to walk and you're going to go towards the land of Canaan, the land that I've promised you. And the book of Numbers is this 40-year event where they decided to not believe God and not claim his promises. So God says, all right, if you're not going to go in and take the land, then you can sit here and wander around the desert for 40 years until every one of you is dead. Every one of you is gone, with the exception of the few that believed God and said that we can, we can go take this land. So then, so at the end of Numbers, they've come back to the land of Canaan, the land that God's promised them. They're standing at the Jordan River, and they can see Jericho on the other side. They're about ready to go take the land. It's that close. God has already told Moses he's not going in. He's already established Joshua as the leader of that particular group of people going into the land of Canaan. Joshua's going to take Moses' place. And, we're going to, and you see in the book of Joshua when they go into Jericho and they take the land. But God wants to make sure of something. They've been wandering around the desert for 40 years. I don't remember yesterday. If you want me to remember the entire book of Exodus and Leviticus 40 years later probably not going to happen. So God commands Moses to retell the law that he had given back in Exodus. Before you go in, I want you to give them a reminder of what it is that I expect of them. That is the book of Deuteronomy. It's a rereading, a retelling of exactly what God's plan is for the people going into this land to claim the promises. And I think that's true in our own lives, that we need to do that. We, we have a very short memory when it comes to God's blessing in our lives. We have a very short memory. So we sit here, and God blesses us one day, and God does something really great, and then five years later, we're going through kind of the same thing, and we've forgotten everything that God's done, and now all of a sudden we're in this complete, desperate panic because I've forgotten everything that God had done for me and through me in the past. We have a short memory, and God wants to make sure that these people remembered that he was the one that brought them out of Egypt. He was the one that delivered them from bondage. It was all him and none of them. And that's the context of reading into Deuteronomy here. And he wants them to know exactly how he expects them to behave and exactly how he wants them to operate in this promise that he's going to give them. So the first thing that I want us to realize and I want us to look at is actually before we get to Deuteronomy 26, I want to read Deuteronomy 6, verse 4 through 15. And here, remember the context of the reissuing of the law. It says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. And this is important here. This is the command that we have when it comes to raising our children and all those things. He says, You shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. It's a really funny story that I don't have time to tell you. but uh, You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates and when the Lord your God brings you into the land that he swore to your fathers, to Abraham to Isaac and to Jacob to give you, and here's where it gets tricky, with great and good cities that you did not build. 
and houses full of good things that you did not fill, and cisterns that you did not dig, and vineyards and olive trees that you did not plant. And when you eat and are full, now this is where the important part is, then take care lest you forget the Lord. Him you shall serve, and by his name you shall swear. You shall not go after other gods, the gods of the peoples who are around you. For the Lord your God is in your midst, and he's a jealous God. Lest the anger of the Lord your God be kindled against you, and he destroy you from off the face of the earth. Now let's look at that. <clears throat> he's saying, you're going to go into this land. It's not your land, but I'm giving it to you anyway. It's full of grapes and honey and milk that you didn't raise, but I'm going to give it to you. It's full of water and cisterns and all these things. It has everything that you need and then some. The language that the Old Testament uses says it's flowing with milk and honey. And you didn't earn any of it. Zero. The only reason I'm giving you this land is because I made a promise to Abraham centuries ago. And because God is faithful, he's going to fulfill the promise. He knows full well that Israel is going to break the promise. He's very well aware of that. But because God's faithful, he's going to honor the promise that he made to Abraham. And he's going to give them a land that's flowing with milk and honey. It has everything that they need, everything that they want. And he knows that they're going to forget where the blessing came from. So here's the point I want us to get. And if you really don't get anything else the rest of the day, try and understand this point. <clears throat> because in America, I don't think we understand this. And here's the point. We all stand on the shoulders of somebody else. In America, we tend to think that I've worked hard for what I got. I've earned everything that I own. I can pull myself up by my bootstraps because I work hard. And if I work hard and I hear this in the political discourse and it drives me crazy, uh, we believe that if you work hard enough that you will prosper at some point. When the bottom line is that may be true in America, but that is not true anywhere else. We all stand on the shoulders of somebody else. We all benefit from the work that somebody else has put in. So the question is how does that happen? Well, let me give you a couple examples. We all stand on the shoulders of other people because of the place we were born. See, you might say that I've earned everything I got because I worked super hard, but if you were in sub-Saharan Africa and you were in South America, it, didn't matter, it wouldn't matter how much you work at all. You're still going to be poor, you're still going to suffer, and you have no hope of getting out of anywhere. And they, they can outwork most of us. But because of where we're born... Our hard work can produce great fruit. And the only reason you were born here is because of the grace of God. So don't think that all of your blessing is simply because you worked hard. No, it, it, that's part of it. But the reason it has so much weight is because God graciously put you in a land and a country that allowed that to actually produce something. Crickets, yes. We all stand on the shoulders of somebody else because of our access to the gospel. I want you to think about this. There are countries and people all over the world that have never, ever, ever even heard that there was a man named Jesus. And even heard that that man loved them so much that he died for them so that they don't have to operate in their sin and their shame anymore. But in America, we have a glut of access to the gospel. Most of us have multiple Bibles that sit on our shelves. I use that word, sit on our shelves, very forcefully. Most of us have many Bibles that sit on our shelves that don't do anything. Most of us have been to more than one worship concert. Most of us have been to multiple conferences where someone's preaching the gospel, telling us about Jesus, all those things. Most of us have this wonderful glut and access to the gospel. 
And I want you to think that if God had so chosen that you would be born in one of these villages in Africa, you may not be a believer today. Because you would have never heard the gospel. Uh Uh-oh. Apparently my tablet thinks I'm done. It's wrong. Our access to the gospel. We stand on the shoulders because of our rich church history. I want us to look at something really quick. If, If you've got your Bibles, turn over to the gospel of Luke. We're going to read one verse in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 10. Luke, chapter 10, verse 13, says this, Woe to you, Sherezin, woe to you, Bethsaida, for if the mighty works done in you had been in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. One of the things that I've learned in in my Bible education is that there's greater responsibility for those for those who have experienced a greater understanding of the gospel. So what Jesus is saying in Luke there is if I had done the same things in these towns that I did in you, those people would have repented. But because you didn't repent, Woe to you. That's a very negative word. Woe to you. That means destruction on you. We are held accountable for what we do with the knowledge of the gospel that we have. And I'm going to tell you that in our world, we have more access to rich church history and understanding of the gospel than any generation and any country that has ever existed. And the, pe- the church in America treats that with indifference. I don't really care to want to know what the Bible says about something. All I have to do is look. I can do a Google search and look and read commentaries. I've got access to all those things. Amazon has millions of dollars in inventory of commentaries that you can read. Guys that have studied this stuff. History from the church all the way back. We can read authors all the way back to the time of Jesus. And we're kind of indifferent to it. Don't really care. I'll just wait until I sit down on Sunday and have the preacher tell me what I should think. All you have to do is ask my brothers. If you're waiting for me to tell you what to think, that's a pretty dangerous place to be. That was enough out of you. So we all stand on the shoulders of other people. We all are where we are because of things that other people have done that we don't deserve and we haven't earned. Cheerful. Yay. And really, to be honest with you, when you look at that passage in Deuteronomy 6, when you think about America, we are living in a land that wasn't ours. We are living in great wealth that we don't deserve. We have resources that other people only dream of. And Jesus says that these blessings have been done in other places. They would have honored him. But we take credit for ourselves. I did it. I earned it. So, now that we understand that everything that we have is just a gift of God. They call it general grace. Everything that we have is a gift from God. Every, the breath that you breathe right now, you're not even guaranteed the next breath. The breath that you breathe right now is a gift from God. You could not take the next one. It's quite possible. But God says when we see this, when we see and we understand that this is all a gift from God, that we should take care lest we forget who brought us out of the land of Egypt. Lest we forget all the blessings that God's given us. So what is Egypt for us? Very simple. Egypt for us is sin and bondage to sin. 
God led the children of Israel out of physical bondage. He's led us out of spiritual bondage. I am no longer a slave to the sin that so easily besets me. I've been delivered from that, and I need to take heed lest I forget everything that God's done for me. So thankfully, God just doesn't think and say to you, well, you just be grateful. He actually tells us exactly what we should do to express our gratitude, and that's where we come to Deuteronomy 26. We're going to read Deuteronomy 26, verses 1 through 11. Starts with the very same language. When you come into the land that the Lord God is giving you for an inheritance and have taken possession of it and live in it, you shall take some of, some of the first of all the fruit of the ground which you harvest from your land that the Lord your God is giving you, and you shall put it in a basket, and you shall go to a place that the Lord your God will choose to, to make his name to dwell there. And you shall go to the priest who was in office at that time and say to him, I declare today to the Lord your God that I have come into the land that the Lord swore to our fathers to give us. And then the priest shall take the basket from your hand and set it down before the altar of the Lord your God, and you shall make response before the Lord your God. A wandering Aramean was my father, and he went down into Egypt and sojourned there, few in number, and there he became a nation, great, mighty, and populous. And the Egyptians treated us harshly and humiliated us and laid on us hard labor. Then we cried to the Lord, the God of our fathers, and the Lord heard our voice, saw our affliction, our toil, and our oppression. And the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, with great deeds of terror, with signs and wonders. And he brought us into this place and gave us this land, a land flowing with milk and honey. And behold, now I bring the first of the fruit of the ground which you, O Lord, have given me. And you shall set it down before the Lord your God and worship before the Lord your God. And you shall rejoice in all the good that the Lord your God has given to you and to your house, you and the Levite and the sojourner who is among you. This is called the, pro the principle of the first fruits. Now, in our disdain to actually understand what any of the Old Testament means most of the time, most people confuse first fruits with a tithe. They're not the same thing. The first fruits has to do that when you raise your crops, and we'll, we'll apply this to all of us later, but farmers should understand this. You plant your crops, and you do everything you can to get the highest yield possible, but you have no idea what that yield is going to be from year to year. You don't know. You plant it, you do everything you can, and then you hope for the best. And what God is telling them to do is that they need to set apart in their heart this first little bit, this first amount, and you're going to bring it back to God, and you're going to recite these things. And it, the, if you read that and you understood that, what he's saying is you're going to take this first part of your harvest, and you're going to present it to the priest, and you're going to use it, and you're going to make this statement proclaiming that God brought me out of Egypt... And God has blessed me with what it is. And God has blessed me, and I'm going to rely on him for everything. Now, here's the problem. We tend to think that differently than these guys did. They would raise a little, they would harvest a little bit, and then they would have to live off of the rest. But the problem is the tithe, what the, the scripture says, the tithe means 10%, right? 10%. Well, the problem is in order to give 10%, I have to know what the yield's going to be. If I'm going to give 10% of what I yield, I kind of have, there's one more number that I need, and what is that yield? I need to know that information. That's not what it's talking about here. And in fact, later on it says it deals with the tithe, and the tithe is every third year. But this is every year you come to me, and you don't have any idea what it's going to take, but you decide what it's going to take for you to remember that God brought you out of Egypt. You decide, and you go and you bring it to the priest. It was designed, because in our thinking, here's the way, at least the way I think. I'm not going to assume that you guys think the way I think. Here's the way I've always operated. I'm going to get a paycheck. And I'm going to give my tithe, my 10% of my paycheck. And then I'm going to pay the rest of my bills. And then if I have anything left over, that's what I'm giving to God. 
as extra, as a remembrance that God has brought me out of slavery and brought bought me out of sin and all of those things. If I've got anything left, that's my first fruits. If it's the last, how can it be the first? If it's the last, how can it be the first? So the idea of the first fruits is that we're to give God out of the beginning, out of the first. We're to give him the first of everything. That's why you hear things like the firstborn. God gave Jesus as the first fruits or his firstborn son. We're to give God first as a remembrance of what God has done for us. But it doesn't stop there. Not only are we supposed to give to God first, we're also supposed to give God our best. Let's look at another fun verse. Malachi chapter 1, verses 6 through 8 says this, A son honors his father, and a servant his master. If then, This is God speaking. If then I am a father, where is my honor? And if I am a master, where is my fear? Says the Lord of hosts to you. O priests who despise my name, but you say, how have we despised you? And Jesus is like, okay, I'll answer that question for you. By offering polluted food upon my altar, but you say, how have we polluted you? By saying that the Lord's table may be despised, and then he clarifies that. When you offer me blind animals in sacrifice, is that not evil? And when you offer those that are lame or sick, is that not evil? And I love the sarcasm that God gives. Present that to your governor and see if he'll accept that. Present that to somebody else and see if they take it. Doesn't God deserve better than any man on this planet? But instead, here's what we do. So we don't, bring, we don't do a lot of sacrificing here. That kind of gets frowned on in today's day and age. We don't sacrifice animals in the sanctuary. But here's what we do. We have people in need. And when they come in and say they need a coat, what do we do? I got a spare one that's been dirty in my closet for how long? You can have my leftovers. Hey, uh, this person needs uh, some food. Well, hey, I've got, I can go buy the 50 cent pot pies that are in the freezer for you, even though I've got a freezer full of great stuff, of steaks, corn. We offer to God our leftovers all the time. All the time. But God says, give me your best. Do you notice that when he talked about the, the Passover lamb, that it was supposed to be a lamb without blemish? It's supposed to be perfect. And in fact, that's one of the reasons why Jesus got so mad at the temple when he had to cleanse the temple, was what was happening is people were bringing their lambs for sacrifice, and they had priests outside saying, that's not a perfect lamb, so what I will do is I will sell you this lamb, and you can give me your other lamb. And then when the next guy would come, he would take the lamb that he thought was not perfect, and then give it to the next guy, and then this was this ongoing thing. He They were robbing the people by saying your lamb's not perfect for you but it's perfect for the next guy so you buy my lamb and then I'll sell your lamb to this guy and somehow there was a Ponzi scheme they were just but God expects our very best the very best that we have that's what God asks of us that's what he wants our first he wants our best first and best so the question is, should we as Christians today, should we participate in the first fruits? The principle or the feast of the first fruits. Actually, it was a feast in the Old Testament. It was one of the feasts that God prescribed. And here's the deal. It all happened at the same time as the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So first of all, they would celebrate the feast of the Passover on the 14th of the month. I won't bore you with the name of the month, but the 14th day of the month. Then the Feast of Unleavened Bread started on the 15th of every month. And then that was, it didn't matter what 
day that was, if, if the Feast of Unleavened Bread started on the 15th, and that was, you dedicated that as a Sabbath day. No one could work on that day. Even if it was a Tuesday, no one could work on that day. And then the Feast of the First Fruits was on the day after the Sabbath, meaning, so you got the 14th, 15th, and 16th. So on the third day, that language sounds familiar. On the third day, they were to offer the feast of the first fruits. And then we start seeing these images of Jesus show up. And Jesus was the Passover lamb. Keep in mind, he, this was all happening at Passover. He was the Passover lamb on the 14th. He, they honored him and bringing, him, bringing them out of Egypt in the Feast of Unleavened Bread starting on the 15th. And then God offered his first fruits of Jesus, the resurrected son, on the 16th, the third day. Jesus is the fulfillment of that Old Testament law. Jesus is the fulfillment. So we don't need to have the feast but there's principles there that we need to understand. And there are principles there that I think we should live by. And in fact, the Apostle Paul said that. 1 Corinthians 16, 2, Paul's talking to the Corinthian church. And he's instructing them on how they're supposed to give. And he says this. He says, On the first day of every week, each of you is to put something aside and store it up, as he may prosper, so that there will be no collecting when I come. Same principle. Laborers in the New Testament, they would sit there and they would work all week. They'd get paid on Saturday. And before they paid anything else, on the first day, you set aside a little bit and you bring it to the priest. You bring it to the pastor of the church. It's different than the tithe because you don't know how much you're going to make from week to week. You have no idea. It's different. Before I know how much I've made, I'm to give something back to God. And now I have to hurry. And the reason God does that is so that I am not tempted to give God what is left over. But that I'm going to honor God first in everything that I do. And he does it with money for a reason. It's not that money is the only thing that we offer to God. He does it with money for a reason. Because he said where your treasure is, that's where your heart's going to be. So he knows that what we do with our money is indicative of what's going on in here. So he starts with the money because that's where our heart is. But everything, God wants all of our lives. He wants the first fruit of everything that we have. He wants the first fruits of my time. He wants the first fruits of my resources. He wants the first fruits of my family, that I would honor God in my family first before we honored anything else. Everything in my life that has any value whatsoever, I'm to give God my best and my first before I do anything else. And this is how I'm supposed to show my gratitude to God. And that you don't forget. You want to say thank you to me. Give me your first. Give me your best. That's why... So if you read the, if you've read the, the story of the Battle of Jericho, it's a great story, right? There's walls come crumbling down. It's just as great. We got songs that we march to. It's fantastic. But God said that Jericho was to be under the ban, which means that you utterly destroy everything in it, and you don't take anything from it, because Jericho is the first fruits. It's mine. The first city you go into to conquer, and, and the promised land that I give you, you don't take any of the spoils. The rest of these towns that you go into, and you utterly destroy them, you can take their gold, their cattle, their sheep, you can take all of it. I've given it to you as a gift, but Jericho is mine. The problem was, not everyone believed that. And there was one guy kept just a little bit for himself took some gold hid it in his tent underneath a rug and when Israel went up to battle the next city they were 
The funny part about it is, is Jericho was this big, huge town, this big, huge city, and they destroyed it without raising a sword. All they did was yell, and all the walls came down. The next town was a little dinky town that they should have obliterated without a thought, and they got run out of town. And Israel panicked. And God said, you, someone has taken what's mine. It's mine. I need to give God my best and my first. Personally, in my family, and also the church. The church needs to honor God with our best and our first before we do anything else. So now I'm going to share my heart with you. No Bible verses, no open Bible. What I would love to see this church become in the next coming years is I would like to honor God first when it comes to how we deal with people. How we, before we even know what kind of money we have, before we even know what kind of resources we have available, I would like to see the Big Springs Baptist Church say that we believe that God's going to let us do this this year, and we're going to give accordingly, and we're going to trust that God is going to give us everything that we need to take care of that. Let me give you an example of that. I would like to actually have um, a line item or whatever in the budget that is specifically for evangelism. That's all it's for. And in that evangelism, I want to be able to have people in there that all they do is they just sit there and think about random acts of kindness. How can we just bless someone today? And then have the resources to be able to do that. I want us to be able to put on events where we can preach and we can sing and we can have Q&As and we can do these things where people can come and hear the gospel because we are so blessed. We are so blessed for it. I would like to, and the only way that's going to happen, that's never going to happen if we only give God out of the leftover. The only way that that's going to happen is if we as a people decide now that I don't know what God's going to do next year, but I'm going to trust Him to enable me to enable the church to reach a lost generation to reach a generation to reach a community that is completely and totally lost but we can't do it by giving God just what's left over because I'm going to tell you exactly what happens in my budget there's nothing left over I spend it all there's nothing left over We have to intentionally decide that because God has so blessed me, I do not want to forget the blessings of God, so I'm going to give. Over and over and over again, the Bible says that. I can, I, I can show you Old Testament all the way through to the book of Revelation, that God is a God who gives. He gives and he gives and he gives and he gives and he gives. And I would like us to think of people first before we think of things like buildings before we think of things like copiers and paper and administration and all those things that we would think about the gospel first because that's our best the gospel is the best thing that we can offer anybody not another program trust me I, I would love nothing more than to completely and totally uh, redo the sound system here. It drives me insane hearing speakers crackle and everything else. It drives me nuts. I'd love to do that, but speakers aren't my best. The gospel's the best. And I want to give God the best. And I want to give the people the best that we have. That's my heart. I would like us to look at what we do with the gospel first. And then be good stewards of what God has us do with the rest of it. Because honestly, I, I don't think that it looks very good to spend all the money there and then have a building that's crumbling down and not be able to do anything else. We have to be good stewards of what God's given us. But I want us to think 
of the gospel first. So that leads to, I have not been good at this at all. I have, this is not something that I excel at. This is something that the Lord has convicted me on in the last couple of weeks. He's convicted of me. He's convicted me and said, you, you don't do. I'm, I'm so worried about making sure I pour enough money into my house in Jefferson that I don't even think about that stuff. Don't even enter my head. Woe is me. Woe to me that I wouldn't think and be grateful to God first and best. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this time. God, I ask that you would cause these people to wrestle with this principle. That you would meddle in their hearts. That you would mess with them a little bit. That you would convict where necessary. That you would inspire. But God, more than anything else, that you would raise up Big Springs Baptist Church to be a beacon on a hill that shines forth the gospel with everything that we have. That we would give you the best of what we have and the first of what we have. And that we would honor you that no matter what, in everything that we do, God, if it's my family, that, that I honor you first and best with my family and the time with my family, that I don't neglect that. God, if it's the community, that we would honor you first in our community. But God, let us never forget. Let us never forget the bondage of sin that you have so graciously delivered us from that we didn't earn and we don't deserve. And God, let us be the people that you would have us be. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Um,